Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. In this video, I want to talk about Jerusalem, specifically the Siege of Jerusalem, which is the final battle of the War of Gog and Magog, just before Christ comes to the Jews on the Mount of Olives. And how I think it's a very real possibility that we could see this very soon, even within the next few weeks or a couple months. And the reason why is because Ramadan is coming up and it's happening during this war. I've already done a video where we covered this. Uh, this is Defense Minister Yoav Gallant of Israel. Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas hope to turn Ramadan into second stage of October 7th. But in this case, they're focusing on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem itself, right? So they're calling on Muslims and Arabs everywhere to descend on Jerusalem during Ramadan. And I, I think it's a very real possibility that we may see scenes like this, a lot of violence throughout the city, and people having to run for their lives. And um, Ramadan this year, today's the 7th, uh, it's going to be happening, it's going to start next Monday on the 11th, and then it's going to run into April uh, until the 9th, which is the day after the eclipse, which is very interesting. Uh, remember, we also covered this article from Israel 365 where they noted the eclipse that took place, the one that went over Utah, how that was just seven days after the attack on October 7th. Um, so this may be something similar. I don't know. This eclipse that's coming up, it may uh, bring, bring in the end. I have no idea. We'll just have to wait and see. But in any case, um, I have a couple new articles I wanted to share with you and comment on. This one's from Israel Yahom. Sinwar's goal, turning Ramadan into a regional October 7th. Five months after the outbreak of the war, and even more so as we enter the, the month of Ramadan, the moment of truth for Israel's campaign appears to be rapidly approaching. For years, the despicable murderer, Yahya Sinwar, has been using the, this important period for Muslims as a tool to increase hatred. This year, according to Israeli sources, he has a special goal. Quote, he wants something to happen during Ramadan that didn't happen October 7th, they explain. In other words, Sinwar is banking on Israeli Arabs, Palestinians of Judea and Samaria, otherwise known as the West Bank, Hezbollah, and other regional players to do what they did not do on October 7th, actively join the war. Now, before I continue, remember, they named this war or this operation or campaign or whatever you want to call it, al Aqsa Flood, and alternatively, al Aqsa Storm. And in the early days of the war, they were putting out all sorts of messages to the Arab world that now is the time to do this. This is the you know, this is the last straw. This is where we're actually going to uh, destroy Israel, remove them from the map. And they called on everybody to join. And uh, you did have different groups join in uh, different ways. Remember, uh, Yoav Gallant said, <coughs> excuse me, that Israel is currently fighting a seven front war between uh, the Houthis in Yemen, which have fired uh, rockets toward Israel and they've attacked commercial ships in the Red Sea. Uh, they've used drones as well. You have the war going on in the Gaza Strip. You have the West Bank. There's been uh, conflict and, you know, small arms combat and conflict in the West Bank. Hezbollah has somewhat been involved. There's been low intensity conflict with them. And we're going to talk more about them later on. And then you have uh, the militia groups in Syria and Iraq, and then Iran itself, right? And uh, I don't know, I don't, like I've said before, I don't think that Hamas was acting alone or that it went rogue. I think it's part of a bigger plan, if I had to guess. Um, but whatever the case, when the war started, uh, you didn't have like a big mass general uprising against Israel where you know, suddenly Jerusalem was stormed uh, on all sides. But maybe now that people have, have had time to get radicalized and enraged and maybe a little bit more organized, 
maybe it will happen this time. Um, in the past, Ramadan has been a time for violence in Israel. And so uh, with what's going on right now, maybe even more so. All right, but let's, let's continue with this. This is the reason, or at least one of the, one of the reasons, that he's obstructing the talks on a deal for the release of the captives. After all, a deal would entail a lull that would lower the flames, deprive Hezbollah chief Hassan Nasrallah of an excuse to attack Israel, and reduce the fervor and tension across the region. Sinwar is eager to once again ignite fire and brimstone like on October 7th so that the region would be set ablaze. So um, I think that this is serious, especially coming from Yoav Gallant, because like I've pointed out before, he's said a lot of things in the past that have turned out to be true. So he has a pretty good track record with me, at least. And I think that things are going to erupt. Um, let's cover a few more things. This is from CBN. This is a Christian news outlet. Ramadan begins in a few days and has often been a time of increased Muslim violence. With the ongoing war in Gaza, Hamas, Iran, and, other, and its other proxies are openly calling to recreate Hamas bloody violence of October 7th, but this time in Jerusalem and on the Temple Mount. You know, because that, that's like that's a big factor when it comes to warfare is the psychological element of it. And if you focus it on something like the Temple Mount and you have that be the the rallying call to, you know, save Al-Aqsa, um, th- th- it's really powerful psychologically. And um, it could amplify things if, if they successfully pull this off and um, they create chaos. <laughs> Excuse me, they create chaos uh, in and around the Temple Mount. And inevitably what's going to happen is if people respond to this call, let's go to Jerusalem really quick. If uh, people respond to this call to go to uh, the Temple Mount, and if people uh, ignore the restrictions that Israel has placed on the Temple Mount during Ramadan, because there's been some age restrictions that have been put in place, if they go against that, then that's going to cause uh, Israel and Israeli police to respond, which is going to escalate things. And then it's just going to be, it's just going to go back and forth and get more and more violent. Uh, I don't think there's a very good chance that um, things are going to go peacefully during Ramadan. And I feel like they're in a catch 22. If they, if they don't impose any restrictions then you're going to have those younger Palestinians that go up there that are wanting trouble. And then if you do impose the instructions, then they're going to use that as justification to uh, fight against the police and uh, against Israel. It's just like, it's a catch 22. I don't think there's any way out of this. I don't think there's any way that this can go peacefully. Okay. Continuing. Uh, President Bi- President Biden asserted, quote, There's got to be a ceasefire because Ramadan, if we get into a circumstance where this continues through Ramadan in Israel and Jerusalem, it could be very, very dangerous, end quote. For instance, Turkish President uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan is warning Israel to drop plans to restrict access to the Temple Mount for Muslims during Ramadan, or it will face real trouble. Now, uh... What I don't know is, is he directly threatening Israel? Like, would he ever use military force against Israel? I don't know. Uh, There's been a lot of warnings from him in the past and threats, especially since the war started. But whatever the case, he's he's saying this now. Um, And then he says, the consequences of taking such a step will undoubtedly be very severe. End quote. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu responded to the, to the warnings, quote, Israel's policy has always been and always will be to maintain freedom of worship for all religions, he said. So I guess we'll have to wait and see how that goes. Okay, so we have this uh, call to um, Palestinians, Muslims, Arabs all over to uh, go to the Temple Mount for Ramadan. You know, 
in how this is going to be phase two of the war. <clears throat> so we have this to worry about. And then in addition to that, we have um, all this going on in the north with Hezbollah, where Hezbollah is still not backing down. And uh, Israel wants to return its citizens to their homes in these towns that have been evacuated in this buffer zone. And uh, nothing has really changed since the war started. Hezbollah continues to fire rockets across the border and attack. And so they're going to have to be dealt with. And uh, we have this article that's come out today from the Times of Israel. Report, Israel threatens to launch war against, against Hezbollah if no deal to withdraw by March 15th. A Lebanese newspaper linked to Hezbollah's terror group claims that Israel has set a March 15th deadline for a diplomatic deal pushing the Iran-backed Iran terror group's forces from southern Lebanon, after which it is prepared to escalate the ongoing border skirmishes into a war. Yesterday, Defense Minister Yoav Gallant told U.S. Special Envoy to the region, Amos Hochstein, that Hezbollah's continued attacks on Israel are bringing the country closer to a decision regarding military action in Lebanon. And uh, this would be a problem if if Israel uh, conducts a full-scale war against Hezbollah. Uh, it's going to be a lot worse than what we've seen in Gaza, I think, because of articles like this, Sky News. A war between Israel and Hezbollah would be far more dangerous than current conflict. Uh, concern is growing about the risk of the Iran-backed militant group Hezbollah in Lebanon declaring all-out war with Israel. Such a conflict would be an order of magnitude far greater and deadlier than Israel's war against Hamas in Gaza, given the size and capabilities of the Lebanese force. And then later on, uh, Israel has by far the most powerful military force. <clears throat> However, Hezbollah can draw on some 20,000 full-time fighters with tens of thousands of reservists, as well as a huge arsenal of potent weapons, far more powerful than any, anything Hamas has. This includes rockets and missiles with a range of up to 430 miles, as well as precision-guided missiles, far more accurately and deadly than the rockets launched by Hamas. In addition, Hezbollah has huge stockpiles of shorter-range munitions as well as armed drones. <clears throat> it means any war between Israel and Hezbollah would have the potential to be far bloody, bloodier and more dangerous than the conflict between Israel and Hamas. So, <clears throat> this may very well lead to the war, or I mean the battle of Armageddon, you know, if that hasn't already taken place. And you may say, well, the, you know, the Battle of Armageddon, it's supposed to be 200 million people. Um, I don't think so. I don't think it's going to be 200 million people in northern Israel. We've talked about the logistics of that. I think that it could extend throughout the world and everyone that supports Hezbollah and Iran and um, Hamas and uh, these different groups. But having 200 million combatants, which is more than all of World War II combined, I don't think that we're going to see that. But it could. It could happen, but I see this could be <clears throat> a natural way that prophecy is fulfilled where you have a major war, uh, maybe the worst war that Israel's ever had uh, with with uh, Hezbollah. And then if others join in, it could get even bigger. Uh, maybe they'll make it into Israeli territory and down into the Valley of Megiddo. I don't know. We'll just have to wait and see. But uh, these are two big, <coughs> excuse me, these are two big things. Uh, all-out war with Hezbollah, and then this call for people to descend on Jerusalem during Ramadan. These are two big things that are coming up, and they're coming up really fast. So again, with Ramadan, that starts on the 11th, so that's just a few days away. It's on Monday, and then if that deadline is true, like that's an actual deadline, the 15th, that's coming up uh, not tomorrow, but next Friday. So next week could be a pretty, uh, it could be a pretty pivotal week. We'll just have to wait and see. Now, I want to address anyone that's like, well, we know that this can't be Armageddon. This can't be the siege of Jerusalem. This can't be this. This can't be that. Uh, usually people 
want to point to scriptures and interpret them in a particular way and say, for example, that, well, we know that it's going to be a three and a half year war. And uh, I don't take that stance. I don't take that stance because of what it says in the Institute Student Manual about three and a half years and how it seems to be symbolic. So let me just give you one example of that. Um, so we have this this uh, conflict, the Arab-Israeli conflict or the Palestinian-Israeli conflict that's been going on ever since Israel became a nation. And during that time, there have been many different wars and conflicts and operations and uh, uprisings and intifadas and terrorist attacks. I think that this is the war of Gog and Magog that's been going on ever since, um, you know, 1947 with the War of Independence, essentially. I think that this is the War of Gog and Magog. These are all the different battles and wars that make up a gr that greater war. And I think that we're pretty much at the end. And when it comes to three and a half, I just want to point you to something that uh, President John Taylor, he was the third president of the church, said about three and a half and how he applied those scriptures um, in in saw that prophecy is being fulfilled. So this is in the Journal of Discourses. Uh, this particular one is uh, volume 21, and we're on page 251. And he says, It was prophesied that it would, in that there should be a certain power arise who should seek to make war with the saints of God, and that it should overcome them. And this power should seek to change times and seasons and things, and that they should be given into his hands until a time in times and the dividing of a time. So in other words, three and a half. That's biblical scholars interpret that as meaning three and a half. And then it matches up with these different um, periods of time mentioned in the book of Revelation and in Daniel. 1,260 days, 1,290 days, 1,335 days, 42 months, da 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 all that stuff. So John Taylor a prophet of God talks about time and times and the dividing of a time. And then he says, these things were fulfilled. The church of God fell into darkness and the priesthood was taken from them. And they had instead something in the form of a bogus priesthood and a bogus creed instead of the true principles, which Jesus introduced among men. So in this case, he's talking about the antichrist power that uh, rose up, uh, after the church uh, was essentially, well, after the apostles were killed and after the priesthood keys were lost, you know, that started the great apostasy. And this entire time of great apostasy, apostasy he's describing as time and times and the dividing of time. It's symbolic. Seven is the number of perfection and completion. So when you have something that's half of that, something that's stunted, something that's imperfect, you know, that would correspond to Satan and when he has time and when he has power. And uh, it's 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 just symbolism. That's all that it is. Um, <clears throat> or at least that's what it would appear based on uh, just like this example from John Taylor. So, you know, symbolism. It doesn't. It's never made a lot of sense to me that you would know when the war starts because that way in like how, exactly how long it's supposed to go because then you can just mark your calendar and... And then have a pretty good idea of when Christ is going to come to the Mount of Olives. Just mark your calendar and then count uh, three and a half years. It, it doesn't really make any sense. It makes sense if, if it's symbolic, if it's conveying the idea of a time of apostasy, a time of conflict, war, uh, chaos, things like that. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out is uh, the fulfillment of prophecy. Um, I've already read this a million times on the channel, but I think it's worth repeating. Okay, this is from George Q. Cannon. Uh, he was a member of the First Presidency. And his whole uh, talk here is about, about unreasonable expectations or faulty ideas of how prophecies are going to play out. He says, We are apt to, to entertain views which are not very correct and which may be the result of our traditions and preconceived ideas. This is a peculiarity that pertains to mankind generally, that whenever they deal with the things of God, or speak about them, or contemplate them, 
and especially when they read the predictions made by the servants of God concerning future events or events that may transpire right before their eyes, they are apt to get sometimes erroneous ideas or at least exaggerated ideas in relation to them. And then later on he says, Even with this experience in the past, the Latter-day Saints themselves are not entirely divested of extravagant views respecting the effects which are likely to follow the fulfillment of predictions yet in the future. Are we not all inclined to look forward to many events which have been predicted by the servants of God as being of so great and wonderful, and may I say so supernatural a character, that when they shall be fulfilled, they will even startle us, who believe they are coming, and will compel the unbelieving inhabitants of the earth to accept them as evidences of the truth. And then later on he says, But my experience has taught me that the Lord works in the midst of of this people by natural means, that the greatest events that have been spoken of by the holy prophets will come along so naturally as the consequence of certain causes, that unless our, our eyes are enlightened by the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Revelation rests us, we will fail to see that these are the events predicted by the Holy Prophets. And then he goes on, and he goes on to talk about how people are looking for supernatural things, things that are magic, and only then is it from God. And uh, I just, I don't think that's right at all. I think that the siege of Jerusalem could happen in this kind of way that we're talking about right now, in that uh, it'll come at a time when many people are not, not prepared. And that's the point. We're not supposed to know the exact time of the second coming. We're in a test right now. And there's a part of this test that's coming to a close. This 6,000-year period of being in a telestial condition, it's coming to an end once Christ comes. And if you haven't uh, progressed beyond telestial by that point, you're done. It's the end of the test for you. You're going to the spirit world. Only if you're living a terrestrial law or higher are you going to be moving on into the millennium? And so you're supposed to be doing what's right at all times. And uh, even us, the Latter-day Saints, those, those of us that know the signs of the times and what to look for, we'll have a much better idea of when it's going to happen, you know, because we'll, we'll recognize the signs. But even for us, we're not going to know exactly when it's going to happen. It's still going to be a surprise. Look at what just happened with the Kirtland Temple. How, you know, it had been in the hands of the the community of Christ for so long, and it just felt like it was always going to be that way. Although I think probably most people assume that at some point in the future, uh, we were going to own it again, but probably not to the millennium. And then without any of us knowing behind the scenes, uh, the president, the, the president of the church and leaders of the church, whoever was involved, were having talks with the community of Christ uh, ever since 2021, and they've been working out this deal. And none of us were the wiser. And then all of a sudden, one day, uh, it's uh, ta-da, it's ours. Like, we wake up one day, and now we have the Kirtland Temple again. And I think it's going to be the same way with the Second Coming. I think there's people that think that it's going to be so obvious, uh, you know, these big, huge things are going to happen, and then we can uh, be ready for the second coming. And I don't think that that's the case for any of us. Um, let me just give you one example. I think a lot of people expect that uh, they are going to consciously be part of Adam on uh, They're going to know Adam on has happened. And then and only then uh, can Christ come. But look what uh, Joseph Fielding Smith said in The Way, of, the Way to Perfection. On page 291, this is about, <coughs> excuse me, this is about Adam and Ayaman. When this gathering is held, the world will not know of it. The members of the church at large will not know of it. Yet, it shall be preparatory to the coming in the clouds of glory of our Savior Jesus Christ, as the prophet Joseph Smith has said. The world cannot know of it. The saints cannot know of it, except those who officially uh, shall be called into this council for it shall precede the second coming of Jesus Christ as a thief in the night, unbeknown to all. So, like I said, I, I've already done videos talking about how we may have already participated in it. 
uh, in different conf- uh, general conference sessions or general conferences like the April 2020 general conference. But I fully expect that when Christ comes to the Jews or when he comes to the world, um, most of the church is not going to be aware. It's going to it's going to come as a surprise, just like the Kirtland Temple did. And I think that's how things are supposed to be because we're being tested right now. So anyway, next few weeks, let's keep an eye on Jerusalem and let's keep an eye on Lebanon and the whole region uh, because things could get really serious really quick. And I think that we're headed in that direction. Okay, that's going to be it for this one. So if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video if you liked it, leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also make sure to share it and I'll talk to you guys later.